Okay, so today is part two. If you happen to miss yesterday's first class, no worries, we'll send you a recording. And we have a recording of today as well. So, and same as yesterday, if you have any questions, please just raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. And for folks online, if you have any questions or comments, just type them in the chat or use the raise hand feature. And when it's time for Q&A, we'll pass it over to you. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, for uh, introducing us and having us here. Um, just a word about the song we just heard. Um, that's 1973 in the GDR. That was uh, the festival of political songs. It was just after Allende had been uh, killed, assassinated, cooped, etc. Um, and the band that was playing there, uh, Inti Ilimani, uh, they remained in the GDR for quite a while after, and they called it their longest tour because they stayed out of the country until they could safely return to Chile, I don't know, 20 years later or something, like a really long time later. Um, and because we are speaking later about internationalism and solidarity in the GDR, we felt we start with, we start with that uh, to get you all pumped up because now the, oh, we have the, we have the power, right? Yes. Um, because today, um, so today is Saturday. Uh, we will be talking about planned economy and socialist democracy and in the end about proletarian internationalism. The first two presentations will be intense. I hope you all have like, you know, pen and paper. This is the technical stuff. This is the stuff we need to get right and we need to understand better. Um, yesterday, for the people who missed it, we talked about why we have to talk about the GDR at all, why to talk about socialism and how the actual specific historical condition really was at the moment after the Second World War and how the GDR came into being and how they set up the path for moving forward towards socialism uh, through land reform, through expropriating Nazi war criminals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Max and I come from the International Research Center GDR. We are located in Berlin. Um, we have brochures with us that you can, for the people who have not gotten them, uh, can get later. And then there is like websites, et cetera, et cetera, and we can discuss more about our work in a little while. And I think I would hand it over to you right now, so to All right. not lose any time. All right. Yeah, uh, a warm welcome from uh, me as well. Thanks for being with us for this uh, session. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to be great. We'll uh, learn something of uh, the GDR that is usually not really talked about. And uh, we'll uh, start with uh, planned economy or socialist economy. Um, and uh, we'll have presentations for each, each topic that we're going to talk about and uh, have uh, some room for Q&A afterwards. I think we'll have also a little break. We planned our session until 7.30. Uh, I think there was uh, a mix up earlier uh, that says that we are ending at 6.30. I hope you're all gonna stay with us uh, till tonight. Um, right, and we're gonna have a, a discussion uh, to round everything up uh, that we've been talking about yesterday and today also um, uh, in the end. Okay. But uh, starting with uh, socialist uh, economy in the GDR, um, why are we talking about uh, this thing at all? Uh, under bourgeois uh, academics, historians and journalists and politicians, of course, it is common sense. Planned economy does not work. It is inefficient. There's no urge for progress and no incentive for the people to actually work well. All in all, planned economy means scarcity, no choices of goods and uh, um, suppression of individual creativity. On the other hand, it is no secret also for those bourgeois elites, although they do not shine light on it, that the capitalist mode of production is not capable of solving the pressing problems of humanity. On the contrary, it produces with necessity the fundamental economic problems like poverty, hunger, housing, uh, shortages, unemployment, financial crisis, environmental degradation, and so on. So how do the bourgeois elites solve this contradiction? They end up saying something like, well, it's not all running well, but it's the best system we got. And um, acknowledging uh, the huge digital project, progress and increase of globally enforced labor division and the consumption process, in the academic niche at least, there has developed a lively debate on planned economy 
They talk about CyberSyn in Chile, Walmart and Amazon. I don't know if you, some of you have read that book. I have not. I did read this one, but not the People's Republic of Walmart. Maybe you can tell me if it's any good or not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, some of these contributions are very pro-socialist also. Um, but um, often, however, also in these debates, there's a strong demarcation against the socialist countries. The kind of planned economy is marked as authoritarian and over-centralized, etc. So um, we want to shed some light on the actual functionalities and the structures of uh, socialist economy as it was built up in the GDR. This field is, of course, it's, it's huge. Uh, from the concrete field of enterprises, labor organizations, unions, price and wage policy, the different sectors of the economy, foreign po uh, economic uh, policy with the Comic-Con and so on. So we will have to limit uh, our input mainly on the on a macro view, so to say, and a general and basic understanding uh, of the economic system. And uh, to start off, I do want to first go back to the Marxist understanding of socialist economy. Marx and Engels established a position of scientific socialism in contrast to utopian uh, socialism. From their perspective, the development of the capitalist mode of production in itself brings up the necessity to abolish private ownership of the means of production. Rise in producti productivity, the process of centralization and concentration of capital leads to ever bigger companies that already establish, to a, to a certain degree, a planned production in the boundaries of their enterprises. This developed capitalist mode of production causes increasingly bigger economic crisis since private production will lead to over-accumulation of capital and overproduction of goods. From the perspective of the historical development of the economic modes of production, it becomes more and more pressing to end the system of private property. And in the Communist Manifesto from 1848, they write, the proletariat, the proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, that means of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible. Marx and Engels did not develop a, con a concept of planning or an idea of socialist economy from scratch, but actually pointed out the historical necessity for the revolutionary abolishment of the capitalist mode of production. They are very clear that the socialist planned economy develops not overnight, but by degree. For them, it is a, a non-commodity producing society, and the planning process needs to be centralized as an requirement for its democratic purposes. They have, of course, different writings where they uh, point this out uh, more clearly. In fact, in different sectors of economy and in different political times, the capitalist state already establishes, uh, to a certain degree, elements of planning. In unprofitable sectors, unprofitable sectors, or in times of warfare, for example. However, the purpose of these elements of planning is deeply intergrown with the political implications um, of the capitalist society. So, with the change in political power in the so so socialist society, the purpose of economic development changes. Mm -hmm. No longer the maintenance and reproduction of private ownership and private production, uh, uh, profit production is the aim of the state, but the collective needs of the people become the criteria of economic decisions. So far, so general <laughs> for an input. Of course, there's many questions that uh, remain uh, unanswered, but uh, about the actual implementation of socialist economy. And these debates also were very vivid, very lively in the GDR. I will get to that. Um, and to dive in, before we dive in into the actual system of the GDR, I do want to start with some theses on uh, the GDR economy that we can maybe relate on later in the Q&A and discussion. So first of all, the GDR shows um, a socialist planned economy is possible. And in the GDR, this ap uh, approach grew the economy enormously within 40 years. The GDR in 1949 is a totally different situation than the GDR 1990. So they actually do um, prove 
the, the, the uh, potential development that comes from plant economy. The population's needs were met in step with the growing possibilities of the GDR economy. And um, uh, this we already have touched on a little bit yesterday mm -hmm. concerning the social achievements that the GDR brought um, and always in degree, so in step by step with the growing uh, um, fundament of the economy. Any contradictions and problems with the economic system must be understood in their historical concrete context. This one actually I want to emphasize because for me it's a, a general uh, understanding or general mindset this is, that is really important when you talk about anything uh, about the history of the socialist countries, the GDR in specific, in specific now. But um, if there's, uh, there's lots of propaganda, lies and uh, semi-truths that are written and talked about uh, the socialist countries and the, we can always remind ourselves, okay, let us, let us check the actual, the actual historical context. Let us check why they maybe have made decisions that might sound wrong or uh, not socialist or whatever, but we can actually understand why they came to certain decisions and developments. Uh, last but not least, the experiences of the GDR with the socialist plant economy helps to analyze some of the challenges that the socialist economies need to overcome. So it's an important input also for future building socialist countries. And there's uh, lots of discussions, lots of uh, challenges, contradictions that we will uh, run into. And I think they're really productive, at least if, if we take them as that, not as arguments against plant economy, but as problems that we need to face and overcome. All right, so um, Francisco already made uh, a great uh, talk yesterday about the uh, starting um, point of the GDR. We uh, cannot understand anything that has happened in the GDR without understanding the Second World War as its uh, point of uh, beginning, point of existence, so to say. And I just want to remind us on uh, certain things that are very important uh, before we go on. So the World War left huge parts of Germany very much devastated. Uh, industry and housing were destroyed, land was made unusable, people experienced hunger, diseases spread. And uh, in the last phase of the war, uh, the Western Allies especially bombed eastern parts of Germany. Francisco also made note of that, famously known as the bombing of Dresden by the British and the US, because they actually did not want to overturn these lands to the Red Army untouched. 98% of all German reparations were paid uh, by the East. 98%. This is, I think, something to sink in. Let's, uh, let's sink in, yeah. Factories and rails were dismantled uh, as part of the reparation payment and sent to the Soviet Union where, where, where they were supposed to be built up again. Later on, they paid goods. They paid the reparations with goods and some of the enterprises that existed in the GDR that were built up were actually owned by the Soviet Union uh, in the, it, until the middle of the 50s, roundabout. Uh, the West instead got supported through the Marshall Plan, of course, we know that. Very important also is to understand that the interconnected economic structure of Germany, you know, it was one country, so the whole trading system, the whole structure of uh, how the economy grew, they were really independent, interdependent, uh, that was cut. So the East did not have any own coal and steel industry, that they had to rebuild this. And they uh, also did not have uh, uh, many raw materials, they had to uh, count on the brown coal they only had. Under the leadership of the US, the West early on established sanctions and an economic blockade against the East, so no goods for military or dual use, um, and no modern products and technology were to be exported to the East. Further on, the open border, this is until 1961, was greatly used from the West to harm the economic development in East Germany. Uh, trained professionals were lured in the West, as well as concrete actions to sabotage and demolish products and industries were executed. Last uh, but not least here, the, until 1952, so three years after the founding of uh, the GDR and also the Federal Republic of Germany, um, only then, uh, only until then, um, the national question for Germany was still unresolved. So the Eastern Bloc, under the leadership of the Soviet Union, played for a neutral, unified Germany. And that means uh, concrete steps towards socialism have not really been taken. 
uh, until then. However, the expropriation of the Nazi and war criminals and the land reform that was already done after 1945, uh, they have yeah, began to build up a structure that is suitable to build a, a planned economy on. Um, all right. Yeah, maybe, maybe it, already there it is important to understand that with these measures after 1945, so the land reform and also the expropriation of Nazi and war criminals, it was it's exactly those economic leaders and elites that were crushed. Like it, uh, it's important to understand that these um, people that uh, usually uh, are able to um, uh, push their interests uh, uh, ahead for the whole society are not not uh, able to play this role anymore. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, We'll start from there. This is uh, until 1952, where we left off. And um, yeah, I want to uh, start talking about the development of socialist ownership. So the socialization of private property did not take place overnight in the GDR. It took place over decades and in different waves. Every new mode of production in history, actually, I would say, developed in a way of coming into being, becoming hegemonic, and fading away. And this is also true for the socialist mode of production that had also to become, uh, uh, come into being and still be, uh, um, yeah, uh, at the same time still having remains of capitalist production and mode of production uh, be, um, be there. Uh, in the table, you can see how the socialist property grew in relation to private and semi-state-owned property over the years. Uh, cooperatives um, that existed mainly in craft and agriculture uh, were also seen as part of the socialist sector. Uh, in the 50s until 1960, uh, agriculture was fully transformed into the cooperative system. And the last big wave of socialization took place in the beginning of the 70s. Um, after that, almost all parts of the economy were integrated in the socialist sector. So you can see here it's 96 to 4 percent. I think even on, uh, until the end, 1989, it was about 98 percent or something. So um, it is very important to understand the impact of this kind of change in the economic relations on the whole society. It massively reshapes the way society works. The economic realm that is under capitalism, under capitalism organized as a private sector is broadly pulled into public sphere. sphere. The interests of pri private owners that are driving the force of societal developments and policymaking capitalism are disabled. Capital and land could no longer be accumulated in private hands. And together with all the interest groups, lobbyists, et cetera, et cetera, are de facto erased as structuring units of the economic and political life. Um, the interest in profit does not exist anymore. There are no people, they might have interest in, uh, in profit, but they're not able to proceed. They're not able to put it into, in, in, into any action. Um, and they cannot play a decisive role for society anymore. And this also means, in general, a great shift in relation of privateness and publicness. That what is sharply distinguished in capitalism, work life, private life, now undergoes a change. Since the sphere of production is centralized in the hands of the state and effectively by the people, Everything that is happening there is of public interest. The, sector of uh, the sectors of life, family life, cultural life, work, etc. become interconnected. Already by the fact that it is the state and the public organizations that are responsible to develop and organize these things. I'm saying this to make sure that we understand the qualitative difference of a socialist mode of production and its overall impact on every sector of society. So um, we will look at the 
planning and management uh, system of the GDR now, I want to introduce uh, the main structural units of the economic system of the GDR. And we'll go from the bottom to the top. So uh, at the bottom level, we have the state-owned enterprises. In German, it's called um, um, uh, it's called like people's owned enterprises, Volkseigene Betriebe, and uh, they build the very heart of the economic structure. Each enterprise had a plant director, who of course did not act as an owner, but he had just one specific responsible role for the whole functionality of the production and planning system. He or she did not have generally different interests to the workers inside the enterprise. Also, the plant director did not earn, did only earn uh, a little better than the worker, usually uh, double of the earnings of a simple trained worker, which uh, of course will lead to some extent of uh, social differences, but uh, in a totally different range that we are uh, confronted by right now. Yeah. And uh, the director also never could decide on his own, but was closely working together with the trade union leadership in the enterprises. Um, the workers in the uh, enterprises were organized into brigades. That's what they called them. This was just the organizational form on the basic level of production. So people who worked in the same group or in the same field uh, were organized in these kind of brigades, usually eight to 15 people, also with one leadership, um, right. And uh, generally, I will come to that later in more detail, the trade unions played a huge role in the level of uh, enterprises, in the whole uh, organizational structure uh, the enterprise worked. They had different committees and had to say in every matter. And you usually also had a party group of the Socialist Unity Party, the SED, that uh, formed from the workers of the enterprise that were uh, members of the party. Um, all right, so from there, the state-owned enterprises uh, associated uh, in what was later called uh, combines. So the goal was that to integrate the production on a horizontal and a, a vertical level, so that the enterprises of different steps of production of the production process were interlinked, and also those enterprises that produced uh, in a similar sector and level of the production process. Um, right. Uh, in 1990, uh, there were about 8,000 combines in the whole GDR. And uh, these combines then were operated from different industrial and economic ministries uh, in the GDR. There were ministries for the electrical engineering, electronics, a chemical industry, a glass industry, uh, Ministry of Cul uh, Agriculture, Machinery, Vehicle uh, Manufacturing. So there were really uh, ministries for each um, sector of the production. And uh, these ministries were part of the Council of Ministers, which functioned as a government of the GDR. We'll get to that uh, more detailed in the next uh, module, talking about the democ democratic system. Last but not least, the State Planning Commission also was part of the Council of uh, ministers and worked somewhat like uh, ministry as well. And uh, the commission, um, the planning commission, stood at the middle of the whole planning structure. It was responsible for the drafting of the plan, the development of the final proposal of the plan. And uh, after the plan was concluded, it also coordinated and monitored the implementation of the planning system. There were subdivisions of the uh, planning commission also in regional and uh, local levels of the GDR. All right, I hope not to scare you with this. <laughs> um, I wanted to make sure to tell a little bit about uh, the actual process of how a five-year plan was uh, concluded. And you might, uh, just from uh, looking at this, get an idea that it actually was a kind of big process. It uh, was an iterative process that usually took also five years to build this kind of plan. Uh, and it actually was a really democratic process as well. Um, it was not a command economy as it's often described. 
So it all started by analyzing uh, the needs, scientific findings and analysis uh, and predictions from scientific institutions, from discussions with citizens also. The state planning commissions developed so-called directives uh, for development. They should formulate general objectives of progress. What are the priorities to improve the lives of the citizens? Um, important points often were very clear, like, uh, for example, better development of housing structure, the development of cars, etc. Of course, individual interests and the collective interest uh, of the society also produced contradictions. Uh, it was not always just possible. Ha having a certain interest for goods uh, d uh, did not uh, necessarily mean that the state is actually going to produce it, since uh, it might not be uh, any good for the whole society to do, to do so. <laughs> um, yeah. Then, whoop, where am I? Okay. Um, the GDR uh, had to spend, um, that's also some, something that is important to keep in mind, or as an example for this, um, contradiction of interest, the GDR had to spend uh, lots of money on arms and military, although they uh, every penny uh, would also have been needed somewhere else. Uh, um, and of course, probably people being questions wouldn't have answered uh, needing arms and military. Um, okay, the Council of uh, Ministers and the Party Congress of the Socialist Unity Party concluded on those Directives from there, the Planning Commission made a draft plan for about 300 of most uh, important goods products. The draft is forwarded uh, down through all the levels of uh, to all units that were important for the whole planning structure. Um, uh, so until the enterprise level and also until the level of brigades that the workers were organized in. And with each step, the pr uh, the draft plan becomes more detailed. So in the beginning, it's 300 uh, products that were planned by the planning commission. In the end, it's, uh, I think, more than 100,000. And um, uh, yeah, the role of these uh, structures was to give feedback if uh, the plan was any realistic, what needed to be changed uh, to actually be able to fulfill the plan. And um, from there, it got uh, up again to the planning commission where they actually uh, drafted the final plan proposal that in the end got voted in the People's Chamber, which is the parliament of the GDR. I also will get to that in the next module. And uh, in the end becomes law. OK, so you can see it was a process that involved each and every part of the economic structure. And all, although there were difficulties and uh, in the process, and the pro uh, did not always go as fluent as they wished, um, mainly the plan worked out to set the correct proportions uh, and tasks for the production units. All right. Um, I now want to dive in this specific level of the uh, economic structure, so the enterprises. Uh, from the overall perspective of the functioning of the socialist planning system, um, this is really important to, to understand what the, the changing role of the enterprises. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, earlier, the socialization of the means of production and also the integration of the production of each enterprise into a central plan, pulls the whole economic sphere into public realm. Building on this framework, the GDR gave the enterprise a much more comprehensive uh, role for the life of the, of the workers. The workplace became interconnected to, the, uh, to different infrastructures of the society and uh, so became like a, a hub uh, for the cultural, social and political life uh, of the workers. Depending on the size of uh, an enterprise, they had their own kindergartens and creche. They had their own po uh, polyclinics, which is uh, the DDR structure for outpatient clinics, and even had their own uh, shops for grocery groceries. Uh, enterprises had to supply uh, low-priced lunches to the workers. Many sports and cultural groups were linked and organized from within these enterprises. 
uh, also candidates for the People's Chamber, which, as I said, was the parliament, had to present themselves in front of workers' collectives and um, uh, yeah, to be actually able to uh, uh, be elected. So also the political discussions, the planned discussions took place at the workplace and uh, enterprises, enterprises also had to allocate uh, vacation facilities. Um, right. Of course, all of this sometimes worked out better than other times, uh, always depending on the people involved. Also, not every worker used, uh, uh, um, yeah, used these possibilities. Um, and a central role for all of these activities and structures in the enterprise played uh, the union. Um, it, was, yeah, it was greatly in charge of this whole social and cultural rights uh, and also the labor rights of the workers. All right. Um, to the union. There uh, were different uh, unions um, for different sectors in the economy, but they were all integrated in the Free German Trade Union Federation, the FDGB, which uh, you can see here. And um, this actually is a quote uh, out of the constitution of the GDR, which I will read out. Uh, through the activities of their organizations and organs, through their representatives in the elected organs of state power, and through their proposals to the state and economic organs, trade unions shall play a decisive role in the shaping of socialist society, in the planning and management of national economy, economy in the realization of the scientific and technological revolution, in the development of working and living conditions, health and safety at work, work culture and the cultural and sporting life of the people, of the working people. I think one could give some time to let this sink in. I don't know what your constitution says about unions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's important to really uh, read, yeah, to actually, it's, it's always a good starting point. For me, it actually is when um, uh, doing something to do research about the GDR, also look at the like laws and the constitution because it always gives you a good idea of how different they actually thought of society and people involved, structures involved. And uh, yeah, they really were serious about giving the union a, a great role of impact for the whole society. Um, all right, we also will talk about the union later con uh, when we um, look at the whole democratic structure. And um, I think it is really important to understand the different difference in the role that a union plays in a capitalist environment to a socialist one. Yeah? With the private ownership gone, the antagonistic contradiction between work and capital fell. Unions remained to be mass organizations um, for the interest of the workers. However, uh, neither the plant director nor the state in general were opposed to the workers' interests. On, to, on the contrary, they were very much aligned. So um, this does not mean that the workplace, as any field of the society of the GDR, were conflict-free zones, but it did mean that if problems occurred, and the unions got active, spoke out, they usually could resolve, could be resolved very fast. Uh, that does also not mean wonders to be possible. Um, work has, um, yeah, it was in the 50s and 60s, working conditions often were still hard after the war, especially in the field of physical labor. However, the unions were very active to realize uh, the strong and far-reaching rights of the workers. Actually, it's uh, here, uh, says Arbeitsgesetzbuch, which is labor code, also something that is uh, we do not have in Germany right now anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but there were very far-reaching uh, laws for the whole workplace. And, um, the unions were responsible to really implement these laws. And uh, I think it can be added, they were also responsible for making pragmatic suggestions like the idea of hard physical labor also meant that the people who did this hard physical labor were, I don't know, the first on going to uh, having health measurements taken for them, et cetera, et cetera. So it was possible to comprehensively uh, work on behalf of the worker and not just say, well, you know, if you have time and money, you could go on a 
trip to, I don't know, you know, recuperate from the work or something. So it was, those things happened in, in unison. And that's one of the roles that the union could play because it was not in an antagonistic position yeah. to the workplace, to the work owner. Yeah. One of the laws that also is uh, striking, looking at the GDR, first of all, is the, uh, um, the fundamental right for work. So uh, every worker had the right to be um, assessed any workplace, at least. So, um, and also dismissals had to be uh, approved by the unions. So it was not as easy to get people off the job. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, yeah, as I uh, said earlier, the union organized in different commissions inside the enterprise. There were, I, I will not bore you with all this, but just to name a few, there were commissions for occupational safety and health, commission for wages, social policy, housing commission even. So the apartment um, allocation that uh, was done in the GDR, also the unions had a say in that and uh, had to make sure that the, those families who actually needed a bigger flat or whatever are the first to uh, be allocated one. Uh, there was uh, um, a commission for the food in the enterprise, a sports commission, a women commission, a youth commission, commission for uh, culture and education and many more. So they really played an active role in organizing, structuring all this. And um, yeah, most of the workers were also were members of the union. Not all of them, well, you did not have to be a member, but in the end, I think it was like 98% of all the, of all the workers uh, that were members of the union. So it also was the, actually it was the biggest organization that the mm. GDR had. Um, and just to give you a glimpse of the role of the, of the massive role of the unions, uh, <laughs> I want to show some pictures at least of uh, uh, the how do you, how do you, uh, workers festival of the GDR that was a regular festival of culture uh, um, and uh, yeah, well, mainly cultural activities. Um, and there were these sports groups in the enterprises and these uh, yeah recreation homes. Um, this one is called Solidarity. <laughs> Um, do you want to add on that? Or? Um, yeah, sure. The enterprises also, uh, just about every bigger enterprise had their own uh, structure of uh, summer camps for children. So that would be something that would be organized through uh, the enterprises. Um, and sports clubs also were not just for the workers, but they would extend to the children of these uh, workers. And so it became a very... Um, yeah, it was like a very integrated and also in some sense a very independent uh, like possibilities possibilities for recreation independent of, I don't know, uh, means of uh, means to pay for these types of things like from holidays to afternoon activities. Uh, this was all integrated. So it was not independent of life and it didn't have it didn't create the situation where ooh, after the job you go and try to live your life. But it became a much more integrated um, process. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'll uh, come to, to an end as the uh, second last um, um, point. I want to say a little bit about the system of wages, incentives and prices in the GDR. And uh, it is as so many themes once you go into, uh, it becomes quite complex. Um, so it would probably require some more explanations. But I'll just give you an uh, yeah, a uh, short overview on this field. So uh, generally speaking, wages were performance related uh, wages. So that meant that the work steps were broken down, eventually uh, every, um, evaluated in uh, terms of time and uh, spe specified as norm. And if the norm was fulfilled, you get a normal payment. If the norm was exceeded, there you would get uh, an additional payment. Later in the 60s, in addition to this norm system, bonus payments were introduced as an additional material incentive for certain efforts. So for example, there existed an um, innovator system. Uh, workers were motivated to make suggestions uh, for improvements to organize the production process um, more effectively. And these suggestions were then evaluated for their economic benefit, if suggestions brought benefit, 
um, the worker got paid a share of this benefit. Um, besides the field of material incentives, we had, of course, the field also of the moral incentives that was uh, existing over the whole time of the uh, GDR with campaigns or through discussions. The relation between uh, effort and the benefit for the whole society was stressed. So there was the saying that the way we work today is the way we will live tomorrow, for example. That was, uh, yeah, just famous, a common dictum, I guess. Um, and you cannot talk about wages without talking about the so-called second paycheck um, that was, uh, yeah, everyone can remember uh, when talking about the GDR. Unfortunately, they often did not realize it in time <laughs> when the GDR was present that there actually was something like a second paycheck. It was not a real paycheck, but the state subsidized many things such as uh, the cost for rent, food, sports, culture, public transportation. So it was really affordable to do all these kinds of uh, things that are, well, society brings up. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was really uh, not much. Uh, in fact, it also came with the problem, as I said, that uh, since it became for granted, the people were not fully aware of the comprehensive social framework uh, they were in. So getting to the uh, system of prices, also, just as a short disclaimer, it's just to give you an idea. I'm not an expert in the f this field of prices, and it actually gets quite complicated. Um, but um, just to give a rough understanding, the GDR had a system of fixed prices. That meant that the prices stayed the same pretty much all over the time of the GDR. There was a few adjustments in the later 60s. There was a price reform that made it a little bit more flexible. But mainly, it was a system of fixed prices. That meant that, um, um, yeah, and how they were set, the costs of material and labor for a product were presented and evaluated. Uh, so through a, like a sophisticated process um, of um, accounting prices, including a range for surplus, um, yeah, these prices were de determined by the enterprises. And um, they were then proposed to uh, the central office for prices. Uh, and in the majority of cases, the prices were confirmed. In some cases, they were corrected upwards or downwards. Bread, for example, as I said, was supposed to be cheaper, whereas televisions were sold at a higher price to compensate these uh, subsidies. Uh, it's important to understand this um, price system, I think at least, because um, first of all, it tells you something about the far-reaching implications of a socialist planning system. This is something that we are not really familiar of. P prices, as we know them, just go by uh, up and down, what, whatever the market is doing. And fixed prices is really a totally different concept, actually. Um, and also because, from how I understand it at least, the system of prices also is in the midst of some contradictions that the GDR was not fully able to solve to the end. All right. Um, so last but not least, I want to uh, talk about some problems and contradictions that are um, to be talked out uh, of um, about the economic system of the GDR. And um, talking of, of these things should not mislead the general assessment of the uh, GDR's economic system. As I put it in the thesis at the beginning, I very much uh, think that uh, actually the GDR, first of all, proved um, a planned economy to be working. Um, the GDR, yeah, they were, yeah, they were able to uh, develop uh, constantly. And actually, over the 40 years, the GDR was pretty much always ranked 15th place in the list of the most developed industrialized countries in the world. So this gives you an idea of actually how far they were able to develop with this system. However, uh, the GDR uh, did not beat the West uh, that was always compared to by the people uh, in the field of modern consumer goods. So um, we should, I think, discuss this problem of consumer goods and uh, consumer culture because it is not necessarily um, yeah, uh, 
um, right, maybe, not necessarily right, that the socialist societies need to compete with capitalist countries in this, in this field of modern consumer goods. Isn't, uh, well, consumer culture that we can see today are very much one of a profit-seeking society and not reasonably related to the actual needs of the people, I would say. So we could discuss the field of um, yeah, competition on the field of consumer goods. There was actually also a time in the 50s, late 50s and early 60s that the GDR tried to establish a socialist consumer culture with uh, shared washing machines, in houses, communal kitchens, etc. So not everyone was supposed to, uh, supposed to possess everything individually. And also until the end of the GDR, uh, some of these things uh, stayed to be uh, part of the reality. Um, for example, uh, products uh, that were built lasted uh, much longer, were not built to break after a certain period of time. There was no kind of thing like planned obsolescence. And uh, also there was a culture of repairing stuff. Um, however, the path of uh, to develop a qualitatively new understanding of consumption and also see this as part of the battle of ideas was not strongly pursued over time. Especially with Western Germany marketing itself as a window to a glowing free market society, this was a hard and I would say in the end a quite necessary uh, battle to take on. Um, through television, radio shows, advertising, etc., the West was in the end quite successful to implement an urge for capitalism, capitalist consumer culture in the minds of the people of the GDR. And also they knew with the blockades in place, the sanctions in place, and the general head start of the Western capitalist productivity, the East was not able to fulfill these carefully placed needs so easy. And um, in general, uh, socialist consciousness plays a big role in the economic field, uh, like owner consciousness. And overall, socialist planning consciousness is, in my understanding, key for a continuous process of building and deepening planning relations in the economy. The workers needed to increasingly understand their new role in the production process and develop a comprehensive perspective of the whole economic planning system to actively take responsibility for societal goals. Um, this, of course, is a complex field that leads to the discussion of the role of material and moral incentives. Uh, bonus payments, for example, can motivate workers to participate in additional ways, but I think they also have a problematic side to them because uh, in the end they tend to undermine this kind of comprehensive perspective on planned economy uh, by awarding, awarding uh, a more narrowed and individual uh, angle. Yeah. This debate also um, leads to one of the most controversial uh, phases of the GDR economy that we now did not go into uh, very much, um, or not at all actually. In the 60s, the so-called new economic system of planning and management was uh, established. Uh, similar reform programs were started in several Eastern uh, socialist countries. Simplified for the GDR, you could say that it was the idea to um, increase the decision-making authority of uh, plant uh, directors and make uh, increased use of material incentives all on the level of uh, enterprises and also on the level of uh, the workers. Um, so, yeah, you could maybe simplify, say, that were some kind of market mechanisms that were reintroduced uh, to manage the production without touching the level of ownership, of course. This, as we saw in the beginning, uh, increased over the whole time of the GDR. And um, it's also important to understand that this reform program was never really effectively implemented and already came to a short, uh, to a sharp end in the in 1970, actually. The following period, 1970 or 1971, is, uh, is uh, a year that you can remember talking about GDR history because it also marked uh, uh, um, a change in um, the head of the Socialist Unity Party between Walter Ulbricht, who was head of the Socialist Unity Party until then, to Erich Honecker. 
And uh, the following period, so from 1970, uh, in the economic development, uh, brought some uh, established some other other problematic um, uh, things on a different level. It is the ratio of accumulation and consumption that was turned around. So um, um, the accu accumulation refers to the production base, so to say, so the production of means of production, whereas consumption means production of consumer goods. And until the 70s, the focus always remained on the first field, investment in, investments in accumulation. Then with uh, Honeck the Honecker period, the investment in the field of the consumption grows faster and uh, at the expense of um, accumulation investments of the production base. This, of course, comes with uh, consequences. Reducing the investments in the base of production will over time lead to a slower economic growth in general and also in outdated machinery. And this uh, development could also be seen in the course of the 80s uh, in the GDR, at least uh, yeah, a bit, I would say. And this development also goes hand in hand with increasing economic ties uh, to the West. West Germany recognizes uh, the GDR on a like a diplomatic level in 1971, and in general they changed their uh, strategic um, um, their, well their strategy towards the socialist camps camp to a they call it Wandel uh, durch uh, Handel, which translates to change through trade, or uh, uh, Wandel durch Annäherung, which is change through harmonization. So they actually try to act quite friendly, <laughs> but of course never change their class base. Um, so dependencies and obligations economically and financially uh, grew. However, the main trading relations still remain with the socialist camp for the GDR, also in this period of time. And this newly formed economic relation and its uh, um, political recognition also did have influence on the political perspective, uh, at least of some of uh, the citizens and also political leaders of the GDR, um, to, I would say, maybe oversee the hostile approach of the West and maybe also developing some kind of illusions uh, of uh, a peace, uh, peaceful coexistence that was uh, also in general the program of the socialist camp. Um, yeah, another thing is that the economic integration in the Comic Con, so this is the uh, yeah, uh, economic um, association of the socialist camp, did not exceed uh, a certain level of arrangements. It worked in the bread and butter issues, but uh, in high technology, it has, has not worked efficiently. So the planning system had. Uh, had actually potential to make greater greater use of this big alliance and uh, gaps that uh, came from there were then increasingly filled with uh, ties to the West. All this uh, also opens up a general debate, I would say, about the necessity to outpace the imperialist countries in the field of modern and high technology to actually prevent problems of dependencies. Because later, sooner or later, these dependencies will come with problems. And uh, last but not least, uh, there's an ongoing debate about the role of the law of value and the commodity production, not only on the, in the GDR, but on, uh, in all socialist countries as a whole. Um, there was a lively debate on these questions in the 50s and 60s in the GDR that was later on, unfortunately, not continued. And I would also argue it was not satisfactorily resolved in this time. Uh, the GDR understood its economic system as a socialist commodity production, and this understanding hindered uh, productive decisions, um, uh, uh, productive uh, discussions uh, concerning the price system in particular to be transferred to a direct working time calculation. And this is uh, a field that's up for more research and debates also uh, uh, now, uh, today. Um, and I do want to stress, however, that the plan remained to be the dominant driving force in the economic field uh, over all time. And the space for market relations, so to say, was kept really, really tight. Almost done. You.
let's stop here. Let's talk about the 90s, maybe after everything. Ah, okay. Yeah? All I right. think this is a good moment to okay. take a break and a breather okay. for everyone. Yeah, I hope it was not too long. I'm sorry that I need to read so much out from my skip. It's uh, much easier for me to yeah, say the important things and not get lost. Um, okay, be okay. forgiving with me. And uh, I'm happy for any questions and uh, remarks that you have.